Uh, one question to Frank and one question uh, concerning Bitcoin. Uh, my question would be concerning growth. Uh, what exactly is it that grows there? That would be my question. And uh, so, for example, capital growth. What would that exactly mean? <coughs> and uh, the other question is uh, about the legal remedies. You basically uh, asked my question. Um, there are equitable legal remedies in, in contract law at any specific point in time of any transaction. And if I understood correctly, then we're supposed to create a machine system that kind of is ex ante defined rules for all sorts of legal remedies. And I would, uh, my, my question then would be, what is about the so-called, quote unquote, elasticity of law? Sure. Okay, would um, the speakers like to respond to any of those questions? Sure. So on the question of, I think I, one question was a comment, so on, on what, what does grow? I mean, primarily the money supply. So the question is how is that filled up with, if you like, production volume, then you obviously enter into measurement measurement issue, right? So. So, uh, no, no index is precise in, in, the, you know, in, in the way that you, if you, go, you end up in this, in this problem that the index numbers are only proximate uh, uh, or approximate uh, indicators for whether you know, the volume has gone up or you, you know, the, the volume of products has gone up and it doesn't capture the quality of the product, etc. But uh, I guess it, 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 it throws you back to the traditional measurement as you doing it today, right? You've got a nominal growth, you have an index number, and, well, you, and you look at that as a, a productive growth. The question came to my mind because you were basically, th th there seemed to be sort of this correlation between stuff, for example, like CO2 growing, or CO2 emissions growing, stuff growing, and what is called economic growth. And I'm not so sure that economic growth necessarily involves stuff growing, or stuff being uh, turned over or produced and destroyed, and but but I, I think it's about the the theory really of what is value, what is economic value. That I I, I feel that this is kind of the sort of the, the basic question that that at some point has to be addressed because if we're uh, you know if I hear people talk about post growth paradigms and stuff like that, they never answer the question what is it that grows there. But as opposed, they show graphs of of us producing more and more, uh, you know, waste and, and producing more and more CO2, but that has, to my mind, has absolutely nothing to do with economic growth. For we could have economic shrinkage and still have open production lines in the sense that there's no closed circles, and we would still end up with only litter and, and waste. And even though the, the economic growth uh, even dropped, <coughs> so that was kind of a... That's a price, that's a commodity. Now, waste is a big growth industry, you know, it's an industry around waste. It's, it has huge economic value. Yeah, it's sure, trading it's, it and it's kind of, you know, has price. What is measured by GDP growth? It's, it's a growth of monetary value, right? And isn't that something <coughs> immaterial? Really? I, I mean, I think if you strip it back, you have to go back to the nominal value, in my view, and it's basically a set of products that have been assigned a price, yes. rightfully or wrongfully. Yes. It doesn't actually matter. Yeah. And then you could conjecture what, you know, or normalize it against base years, etc., and see, see well, what is it actually that we're looking at. <coughs> so at the end of the day, after going through this, I really very much felt like a nominalist. To be honest, <laughs> <laughs> and it doesn't actually matter, you know, what what it is. Uh, you know, it's it's uh, what you know. We got a smartphone, you know, that's that's costing you eight hundred dollars. And last year, it was a different model that cost you uh, probably also eight hundred dollars. So what what is that? Is that inflation or not? So so, so my advice is probably to go back to to the nominal view actually. Yes. Yes. <coughs> but isn't isn't it the case that the value of a property right can change just by changed expectations? I mean, if, if you find out tomorrow that someone wants to buy your house at the double price that, you know, yesterday someone wanted to pay it, then you, then you actually can write more on the <coughs> balance sheet. Yeah, but what's so the problem with this? This is normal. Yeah, right, there, there is no problem. Yeah. That's the point. But, but there is no physical change involved. It's just a change of expectations. So it's an immaterial thing, uh, this, this thing we write balance sheets called value.
Well, and nothing, nothing should change in the physical sphere. Why, why should? Why right. should? If we talk about growth and ecology, then we're it's, talking it's about physical stuff. And, and the <laughs> idea is to, dis to distinguish those two things. Economic growth and growth of turnover of stuff. Mm -hmm. They're not the same. But they're incremental, sure. Yeah, I mean, but you couldn't track the coal production so that, uh, yeah. you know, it's definitely gone up, right? It's probably mm -hmm. an index number that you could readily, uh, you know. There's certainly yeah. correlation. Okay, we need more answers. Yeah, yes. Do <laughs> <laughs> my job for me, thank you. Yeah. Um, yeah, no, thanks. I'll, I'll go to you, uh, you guys first, actually, because interestingly, um, I think you, you raised a point of something around the elasticity of law, um, and, and what I would also consider in terms of judicial discretion, um, which I think fits into that, that particular equation. And it was actually a question I was going to ping back at your particular presentation in relation to contract. Um, that the, the thing that seems, one of the things that seems to be missing from your discussion was, was fiduciary, fiduciary obligations and, and duties, which are non-contractual but are binding. Um, so yeah. it, it, the, the, there's that particular element in that. Um, so in terms of um, the, the, to go back to the kind of the contractual perspective, I mean, yeah, the, the specific performance uh, as an equitable remedy, I mean, a remedy that's enjoyed, uh, that attaches to civil code and German law and, and so on and so forth as well. So I'm not, not uh, claiming it purely for, for uh, the equitable jurisdiction of common law. Um, yeah, I mean, I, I don't, I, 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 I'm not, as, as I um, pointed out, somewhat bluntly. I'm, I'm not necessarily in favour of these things, but I'm looking to, to test their validity. There's been very little discussion around uh, specific performance in relation to, to smart contracts. And yes, there is a problem with how do you deal with the discretionary elements of that. I, if, if you have nothing but exactly coded laws which are triggered, um, the answer to that is we can kind of get um, um, sort of futuristic about this <laughs> and start to think about um, various, I mean, computer science and, uh, scientists themselves um, all often like, you know, like to think about things in layers and the way that these, these sort of layers talk to one another. And I think that's, that's a, 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 a useful model for thinking about how um, the, the potential, the possibility how this, uh, this would work because you would have um, protocols being triggered from other areas, so smart legislation, um, smart uh, precedent um, sort of uh, uh, records. I mean, you know, obviously when we're talking about judicial discretion, we're talking about flexibility or elasticity of law in that regard. Um, technically, um, we are still talking about things which um, can be um, in dialogue with existing records. So from that perspective, there is a possibility, a very sophisticated amount. I've spoken to a, a particular coder, a programmer at the OU, who was looking to um, uh, code the whole of, uh, I can't remember, sorry, it was a particular act he was trying to code. In other words, so that particular act, that piece of legislation, um, when triggered by a smart contract elsewhere or something else elsewhere, um, created a machine-to-machine -machine invisible dialogue that didn't involve any form of human intervention. Um, he, you know, he said he was telling me just on the very basic thing that he was trying to do how ridiculously complex it is. I'm not suggesting in any way that, that we are about to override discretion and the elasticity in the law in that regard. Um, but that does not mean that the potential is, and, and certainly, you know, increasing computational power, these things aren't going to be doable in the, in the near future. And, and my prediction is by the end of this year alone, um, just because of the sheer weight of, of interest that's now being thrown into the blockchain, into smart contracts in particular, there's going to be a hell of a lot of movement into uh, the corporate and commercial sectors in relation to these things as well. And that will, in itself will drive the innovation. So. Wait and see, but I don't disagree with you, absolutely. Um, in relation to the smart, the, the, the smart trusts and trustees and what do they control, um, again, it's not as it's, it's a, a elements of, of the same um, response, really, in, in as much as um, this is a, um, a thought experiment in many ways. Um, however, it's the whole point of my, my paper is talking about this notion of post trust um, because that's what the blockchain. Um, it's talking about. So we're not talking about trustee. We're not talking about trust arrangements or trusteeship um, in that conventional sense at all. We're talking about. Um, we're not talking about a singular um, point of failure to put it in the negative. Um, that is a trustee who breaches their their trust or fiduciary um, <coughs> obligations. We're talking about um, a distributed form of trusteeship, um, which simply administers and manages the property in, in terms of raw process. 
it's a highly, a, highly um, amoral system. Um, for that reason alone, I have a massive problem with it. Um, a discussion that I had uh, at Northern Rose Finance, uh, at Northern Rose, um, over the smart contract discussion was precisely that. It's with smart contracts have, have started to prove themselves in terms of raw amoral process. But where do we go from here in terms of duties and obligations, um, and what it actually means to remove the human? Um, Who is going to enforce these? Well, again, a similar, I mean, in, in a wonderful, wonderful, <laughs> it's going to be wonderful at all, it'll be Skynet for God's sake, um, futuristic world where, where we have, where we have legislate, you know, the Trustees Act, um, um, uh, you know, these, a lot of trust uh, law and certainly in relation to trustees, duties and obligations is bound up in legislation anyway. Yes, it's discretion or, or it's bound up in precedent, which obviously runs back um, many hundreds of years when we're talking about the common law in, in this country. So in that regard, there is, there, is, um, there is data, if you like, that can be mined um, or can be in dialogue with a particular novel situation. Um, but, uh, I mean, there's, you know, I, I cover a, a lot of more, I try to cover a lot more of the, of the sort of the detail of, of what I actually view in terms of um, the future uh, impact upon duties and obligations in particular in, in the paper. Um, <laughs> oh, right, okay. <laughs> it's a working paper, so thank you very much for your comments on it, and, 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 and I'll, you know, I'll, I, I, I take very heavily under advisement the fact that a lot of this is thought experiment, but yeah. Um, yes, um, close to the back. So I wanted to come back to the legal enforcement dimension, and I'm wondering if the information in the nominal terms of money has some kind of parallel, because it took me a long time when I bought something on Amazon to know what fulfillment meant. Well, fulfillment meant actually delivering the book to my door. And, and so I'm wondering the same thing with, with you. You can have this blockchain, you can have this contract, but does anybody really have to do something in the real world, and is it enforceable? So if it's the Internet of Things, then yes, it can be. Mm -hmm. um, you know, and, and then this question about economic value, if you have nominal growth in financial terms, but is it real value to people, and does the system work that way? So I think there's an interesting kind of dual here that needs to be brought together. Uh, one question. Isn't it that the Bitcoin is the outcome of people believing in the neoclassical yes. theory of money. Money <laughs> is a standard good mm -hmm. to alleviate barter exchanges and they try to produce that good, that mm -hmm. material thing money is seen as electronic. Mm -hmm. uh, if I'm allowed, uh, I would like to make uh, a comment on terminology. Yes. You call uh, your academy which is wonderful, really. New European political economics. Yes. May I re remind us how the term political economy came into being 401 years ago, 1615. The first time by Antoine de Montchrétien published a book with a title that combines the two words, Traité d'économie politique. Why was this? Just to, uh, to make it easier for you, to make a difference. Why did he do this? He was the master disciple of Jean Baudin, who was the greatest economist of the 16th century. And Jean Baudin took pride in criticizing Aristotle, Aristotelian economics. He said Aristotle was a great person. He told us that you need, you need production, you need money, you need markets. That's the field of economics. But then he observed a peculiar situation, Baudin. In the 1550s, France had not yet regained the population it had before the Black Mass of 1348. Now Baudin was asking himself a question. If the economy is just dealing with production, market, and money, credit maybe, who is dealing with the production of human beings? Because human beings are not produced like hawks or whatever in a firm. And then Baudin's answer was, to have human beings around, somebody else must be responsible. And that is the state, or the Greek word, that is the polis. 
And that's why they said uh, uh, a comprehensive uh, uh, system or science of economics must always be political economy because the polis must provide the manpower. Mm -hmm. okay. So if you want just to note, so if you say new, maybe by new, you say this is not what we need. Okay. And we are specifically saying political economics. We're not saying political economy for that very reason, because the term political economy has a history in the uh, late 19th century where people like uh, Leon Barra, they wanted to become the physicists of society. So they said, we're going to be doing away with political economy. We're, we're now focusing on economics. And what we do has not, absolutely nothing to do with politics. It, is a, it has nothing to do with the production of people. Mm -hmm. It's just really neat mathematics. We are as, as, uh, we're supposed to be as successful as the uh, Newtonian physicists were. So what we're doing is now economics. And what we say is, yes, they did really bad stuff under the label of political economy. But they also sort of uh, threw out everything else with it proclaiming that economics is somehow unpolitical, and I believe this is one of the most political statements uh, of all, uh, proclaiming that economics is non-political. So what we do, try to do is political economics, getting back in the political perspective, not getting back into the production of people. Or anything. Not, yeah. not you, you, you mean it non-demographic. Yes. Yes, no? yes. But still you would need for your free citizens, you would need some demography. You then, are totally okay. right. Okay, yeah. And this is a very this overlooked topic. We totally, we, we totally agree. Yes. We totally agree. I want to make a comment or a question on, on this issue of buying versus paying. Yes. And you just uh, did a small question around the rules. That's really uh, neat. Um, but I think we did not have enough time to think carefully what you were asking. Uh, because all of us, in our personal capacity, are doing uh, the same thing as you claim the corporations are doing. Yes. Uh, first of all, we are all working for months, and our employers are not paid. And we have the trust that at the, the end of the month, we get, we get the money. Mm -hmm. uh, when we are buying electricity, we are using electricity, the company has trust in us that we will pay the, bill, the bills at the end. Mm -hmm. uh, actually, uh, I think there is no difference in micro and macro in this regard. That every transaction implies some time lag. Yes. And therefore, there is a risk. Yes. And in the financial world, this is to totally trivial that I order from my broker uh, shares to buy and I'm paying and he will deliver it in two days and three days. And if he goes bankrupt, then I, I lost all my money. Yes. So I, uh, I think uh, it's... Uh, your starting point that somehow there is a contradiction in micro and macro corporations different from human individuals, private individuals. I don't think it, 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 it's the right start because we do exactly the same thing uh, in, a, in a simpler way. But uh, you know, if my employer is not going to pay me, I will have difficulties to pay my electricity bill. Yes. And what's the difference between me and IBM or a bank? So uh, I think you overemphasize the difference. Um, am, am I allowed to answer? Um, or are we collecting? We're collecting, <laughs> yes. Yeah, so it's like more of a comment than a question, so feel free to just not reply if you want. So basically, uh, you go through all those pains trying to make up new definitions, much like Keynes, in which he sinned a lot and then led to his own confusion. But why bother going through all these pains if the Austrian School of Economics has already solved all these problems. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Do you deliberately ignore them? There is no mention of Mises, Hayek, Rothbard, all other economists. So consider them, and maybe you'll find some of their works quite <laughs> Where do they differentiate possession and property? But it, it, it doesn't Never make sense. Ever. Is Never ever. If you call Humpty Dumpty, Dumpty Humpty. So the, the essence is still the same. And Rothbard explicitly says that all exchange is the exchange of property titles. No. He, he calls them that. No, yeah, they, don't, <laughs> they don't exchange property title. I mean, von Mises' definition of exchange explicitly rules out law. Mm -hmm. It's exchange of assets. Yeah, but Rothbard says it's exchange of property title. Who says? Rothbard. He, he calls oh, yeah, it. Okay. He calls but, it. But neither Hayek nor von Mises. Yeah, but 
Robert is a little bit different. Okay, in, there's, in, there's in many many lots of varieties of Austrians. So which Austrian are you back from? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm with Robert. Uh, okay. Yeah. Uh, I have a question to, to the um, blockchain and to the Bitcoin. Uh, I mean, obviously, there are different topics, although they are interlinked. Yeah. And if um, going back to the question of property and possession uh, and, and trust, which is for, for property, you need trust for possession. I mean, either you have it or you don't have it, so you, you don't need it, right? And when, when I follow your presentation correctly, you said that with the blockchain, the trust problem is solved because you, you can't, it's decentral and you can't fake it, right? So it's, it, it's absolutely precise. There's no second in, a bit of information and it cannot be generated by somebody who fiddles with the system. Um, yeah. Or are we, are we right? Uh, yeah, we okay. bet that there was, yeah. I'll just get to the, uh, to the end of the question and, and, and correct me if I didn't get it correctly. But with the, and with the Bitcoin, we heard, I think you remarked on it, that somebody creates them and it's very um, opaque on um, how this creation process works. So with money, we have a central bank because we needed the, the institution that, that guarantees that then later enforces um, or the, 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 the property title arrangements. Whereas with the, with the Bitcoin, you have the blockchain, which solves the trust problem. But not the, info the 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 part of enforcing. And um, what I didn't understand is how how does the blockchain relate to the question of of creating uh, this money? Uh, yeah, we're collecting. Yeah, the back. Okay. Um, I have a question um, for Mr. Hofer, Mr. Thiel. Uh, I want to know what is the relationship between your approach as I, far as I understand, you want to find the foundation for monetary economics. Mm -hmm. And what is the relationship between your approach and the approach of the so-called claim theory of money? And um, names that come to mind are Schumpeter and also in Germany, Van Dixon, Elster, and maybe also Knapp, who argued that everywhere you have money, then money basically is a claim on society. So if you deliver a good to somebody else, you get money and this money is nothing else but a claim on society so you can go to society so so to speak to someone else who gives you something back and that's a quite old theory i just uh, gave you some names and what is the relationship of your approach to this approach okay i'd like to make some questions okay from the chair um first i mean questions and comments actually i'll start with um the two two last papers I, what I, one thing I like to, I like very much the approach in general, but also in particular, a lesser point, but it's an important point, I think. It's very important to establish dialogue with, with the people involved. And I like the way you put the MMT in and the, the post Keynesians and actually set them compared. I mean, and, and the point about terminology, I think, is very important because we can have very good ideas, but just speak into a void, and, and we have to start conversation with people and persuade people. Yes. And, 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 my, and I agree, the Austrians, you should engage with the Austrians. You may have to agree with them, but sure. um, we should have conversations with Austrians. Because there is insight in Austrian theory. Yes, totally. Uh, uh, totally. Um, yeah, uh, and... Uh, <laughs> but I have qualms about the label, the political economics label. Uh, I have qualms also for different reasons. I understand the reason why you didn't choose political economy, mm. but that also has problems. I mean, I've been on the heterodox economic circuit for more years than I, I can, well, half a century, okay? Uh, um, and all these labels, they're, re they're really tricky. I mean, political economy, one problem with political economy, it's a nice label in the sense that it's a great tradition and uh, uh, it didn't really mean political economics, but it meant uh, the, 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 the grand purpose of making economics relevant for the whole of society and understanding it systemically was involved and that was celebrated by Adam Smith and by all sorts of people and in Scottish economics there used to be departments of political economy for that reason. Um, political economics I think has problems too. Um, one, for example one journal which has political economics in its title is Review of Radical Political Economics which is a Marxist journal. Okay? Uh, and um, the real problem here is economics. 
And I was just, I just throw in a, a different alternative term, and that's legal institutionalism, right? Um, e economics carries too much baggage, and the political economy carries too much baggage, and, and adding the political to economics is problematic because you keep doing it. There's a, the paper coming out, which you can get on the web, it's a uh, pre-publication version, it's going to come out this year, it's called Le Le On Legal Institutionalism, Catherine the Pastor is co-author with myself and a few others on that, you can get that. Um, just to throw that out. Um, and remark on the keynote present at the excellent keynote presentation and the last two papers as well. I mean, one thing that strikes me is, I mean, a lot of these arguments are really very exciting and very important. There's, there's barriers to acceptance. Why is it, why is it that the penny is not dropped? And, and I think there's two, just, just two uh, thoughts come to mind. What, why, why are there barriers? One barrier is political. Because if the debate is, between free markets, free market Austrians and other free marketeers, and statists to see every problem as a state problem, right. then where does this, it doesn't fit, because it says both the state and the market. You need for a market, you need property, you need a state, okay? And so you don't, uh, the market is an anti-state, the market requires the state. And also politically for liberty, for freedom, you need property, right? So, so it defies traditional two-track thinking, libertarianism versus statism, or whatever you want to call it. And I think that's one reason why it's resisted. Now, I present, I've tried to present some of these, ar these arguments in the states, and they have simply no notion of, the, of, of this. I mean, for them, property is just possession. It's just, I grab this, I grab that. It, and the notion of the, of the state being necessary to constitute law and to constitute rights more than a sort of smash and grab grab, it's sort of fight between people, or Western Jew or whatever it is, it's just simply absent in, 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 intellectually. Um, and that's, that's one of the problems, it's the polit political one. The other one is just as serious, and that's, we, we almost touched on it, and that's, what's the underlying metaphor here? And, and Gunnar's talk, he said, all these people think in terms of physical stuff, you mentioned stuff, it's words for and, and the big culprit, although I'm a great admirer of him, is Adam Smith. Uh, Adam Smith transformed economics into a physical, physical thing. He changed the meaning of capital. Mm. Capital used to be monetizable value. It became a lot of stuff mm. we, we do things with. And, and Smith does that. And, and, and it, Marx follows with that, and they all follow with that. And, and the, all the models used in mainstream economics are inspired by physics and stuff stuff in the world. Uh, um, and to change change this fundamentally is really very big. If it, the, the whole set of metaphors. So the question is, we need another metaphor. We need to replace it. I mean, here I'm relying on very much on Philip Morosky's work, because he's done more than anybody else to explore these underlying met metaphors and the links between mainstream economics and physics. But here I disagree with him, because I had an argument with him in Paris two years ago about this. <laughs> and Because he thinks information processing is a bad metaphor. And I think intermission processing is one of the best metaphors we've got. And this is where Hayek's right. Um, Hayek, the notion of, of the economy as an information processing system, I think, is a way of dislodging this physicalist thing. It raises the question of how we measure this stuff. Now, what are we measuring? Right? That's good. Um, and, it, and, and we have we use information theoretic measures of what the economy is doing. Like neg negentropic measures of complexity, for example. So there are people measuring complexity in the economy, different measures of it. We have to start thinking in those terms and, and doing our accounting systems in information based metaphor thinking rather than just aggregating stuff thinking. Mm -hmm. and, and this leads to the challenges that Frank raised about um, ecological problems and so on. There's, it's disconnecting that thought that the economy is just about producing stuff and disconnecting the practice that we just, just produce stuff uh, and rethinking the economy in a way which actually the economy can move forward and not despoil the planet. Then that, that is, that's part of the story. So, sort of comments. Um, we have time for a few more before we have to speak to come back. Anybody else? No? Speak. Let's do it in order of presentation. Frank? I don't think I have any left.
Um, okay, well, um, I mean, I, I tried, uh, again, I, I, I tried to try and uh, delineate um, Bitcoin quite, quite deliberately from blockchain, even though it's, it's, uh, it isn't possible to do that. I mean, Bitcoin itself, I mean, Bitcoin is not, I mean, to go to this question, I mean, that's a comment earlier. I mean, Bitcoin is not money. This is this is the problem. I mean, and the American courts themselves, in, in really the only litigation of its type that exists, um, although it, it comes hot, uh, hot on um, on academic commentary on this, is, is that Bitcoin is, is intangible property. It's it's not money. Um, so, trying to, uh, I mean, in, in that sense, um, it, it touches upon, I, I guess, um, I mean. And, what I know in, in, in relation to neoclassical uh, economics versus yourself, what well, I'm sure is, uh, is um, uh, we could probably write it on my thumbnail or something. Um, but the, the point, but the, the barter aspect, I think, I don't know if that raises um, the, the um, validity of that comment in, in some ways. But actually, if we move away from money to the notion of, of sort of the, the transfer of, um, uh, of a value or obligations that they become a balance, they become a, a vehicle for the transfer of these things. Um, um, that, that certainly talks to the notion of barter and to um, other sorts of uh, proliferation of notions of a gift economy and, and things uh, along those sort of lines as well. Um, I'm trying to remember what other questions um, I have down here. Um, so, uh, so, yeah, I mean, blockchain solved the problem, of, does blockchain solve the problem of money? So, where is that? that, is that yeah, what I asked you, it, it, yeah. It solves the problem of trust, the that blockchain, was it, right? That was it, yeah. But it, it doesn't solve the... Uh, okay, yes, yeah, so, so the actual minting, if you like, right, of, yeah. of, of, of Bitcoin itself is, um, is, is a, technical, or it's a, a technical process that um, um, I haven't indulged in myself. I mean, it's to do, it is to do with um, mining, and it's to do with um, the transfer of digital signatures, um, where various things are signed in one direction and signed up in the other direction, it becomes a process. Um, where involving incentivization as well, so you you actually earn bitcoins for your um, for your uh, role in the process of sort of mining more bitcoins, um, and in terms but in terms of how that relates to to, um, to traditional notions of inflation and the fact that you can't let these things run away from themselves and just there there is an infinite number. Um, but I, I again I, I mean bitcoin as a, my focus is really more on thinking about the blockchain in, in other directions. But I certainly know, obviously, there, there was but a lot of hoo-ha over sort of, um, the, the Christmas period about the future of Bitcoin, precisely in that relation. Um, uh, Mike Hearn, one of the original developers of, of Bitcoin, um, sold up and, and moved on um, to, to look at it in, uh, in different directions, precisely because he was worried about uh, the future of, of Bitcoin and, and the, the conflicts that are existing within the Bitcoin community about how Bitcoin should actually be proliferated. And, and developed. Um, but again, I, I'm getting into technical realms here that I don't really understand. The blockchain trust element is a slightly different one, and this is, and that, that's got a lot more to do with proof of work uh, ideas and and the uh, the distributed notion of it, the fact that it, there isn't a single point of failure to use IBM's term mm -hmm. in that regard. Um, and but uh, to kind of bring it back into and think about it in terms of law and property, perhaps. Uh, I mean, one of the arguments you could say that law, um, I mean, yes, trust, we, you know, if I, if I want to buy a house off you, I'm going to trust that there are certain things involved in that, notwithstanding there are a number of other legal and equitable mechanisms, actually, which wrap around that whole process. But the um, trust is, uh, has really got nothing to do with law. Law, actually, is, is the offer, is, is the negative of trust anyway. Um, we need law because we don't have trust. Um, arguably, um, this is certainly the, the principle that is is um, uh, a notion which is put forward by uh, a number of other commentators who regards the, uh, law as as necessary due to inherent untrustworthiness that, that, that exists. Um, so, from that regard, I think the blockchain sort of fits into that particular theoretical um, uh, notion of law itself. Um, quite well. Um, it's, I mean, notwithstanding, a lot of this also, I, I mean, 
this, this actually attaches to uh, anarchic the theories as well. In fact, and to go back to the neoclassical <laughs> thing, I mean, that's again, it's an interesting one considering the, the sort of the cyberpunk roots of, of, uh, of Bitcoin, whether they would consider themselves neoclassical economists in that regard, or whether they saw themselves as, as people looking to completely circumvent uh, any notion of legal institutionalism or, or formal um, uh, economics in, in, in any way at all. Uh, there's definitely a cultural conflict that's, that's going on there. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, the, but the trust element, I mean, I think that's why the blockchain is, is an important thing to discuss here um, from, a, from a legal perspective. That makes sense. I've gone around the house a little bit there. Um, let, me, let me start with, with your uh, question to, first of all, the, I, I wrote down the juridical second. So within every contract, there is at least this juridical second. So there is always two credit to debt relationship. I fully agree on that. And, and to the micro macro, maybe this uh, I, I did not really go into, I did not have the time, but maybe we can look at, at uh, this picture here. This is a slight modification of the picture that uh, Wolfgang has shown us. So we have three uh, people, three, uh, let's say, persons. The, the one is a, the legal person called the state. And they have assets and liabilities. And if, if we aggregate this economy up, the behavior of this as an aggregate is just totally different from each and every single one of those balance sheets. And that's the idea that to make the transition from micro to macro is not macro is not a big corporation that does accrual accounting, but macro is actually the aggregate economy. And if you look at the aggregate economy, the tax claims and the tax obligations are net out, you know, they net out to zero. And the private claims and private obligations, they net out to zero. That means in the aggregate economy, the value of the property right is always exactly equal to the value uh, of net worth. And that brings me to the, to the capital notion of capital of, of, of Marx and, and Smith. If you would look at accounting terminology, it would be totally clear that with capital is meant nothing but the liability side of a balance sheet. There is nothing physical to that term at all. Not only are assets not things but rights, but so is a uh, is capital nothing physical at all. It's not a machine, but capital is the liability side of the very same right. So the net worth here and the property rights there, they're not two separate things, but it is a way of keeping track of the very same property rights. Mm -hmm. So that's, that's uh, the comment on, on capital there. Um, the claims theory of money, uh, a claim on society, we're not uh, saying that money is a claim on society, because it isn't. You, you can say, uh, so you, you need to look at the micro here. What is it a claim on? So the, the, the pound sterling note in my pocket is not a claim on society, it's a claim against the Bank of England. That's what it says. That's what it says. And so, so if I burnt up, if I burnt up a note right here, would I destroy money? If I light up yeah. a, a Bank of England note, is money being destroyed? Is the money supply shrinking? Yeah. Yes. Yeah. No. My belief is yes. Yeah. No, it is not. <laughs> it is not. Why? Because in the long run, let, let's let's think you about destroy a claim on the Bank of England effectively. Right, so I'm destroying my net worth, but the Bank of England loses an obligation. Maybe they cannot keep track of every single note, but if, just imagine, burning a huge stack of Bank of England notes, they would not be able to return back to the Bank of England. So at some point, they would just be, you know, make a, uh, make a change in their balance sheet from obligations to net worth. So they gain net worth, and then they pay out to the government of, uh, of, of Great Britain. So thinking of stashes of things as money, thinking of quantity theory is just rubbish. And, and the claim on society, um, that's just, I believe, a misunderstanding of day-to-day -day intuition. Because for me, it looks like I have a claim on the stuff in the grocery store. But the grocery store is, not, is, a, co is a corporation that doesn't barter for things. But the, the grocery store is an entity that is in debt, that has obligations that are payable in, let's say, uh, pound sterling. So they have an, an inclination to offering their property rights in the groceries for a contract that is nominated in Bank of England pound sterling 
uh, money of account. So I can pay that contract. It's not that I have a claim on the stuff of the of the supermarket. So I believe the the claim on society theory can can be rejected there. Um, legal institutionalism. I, I fully agree uh, with your notions there. We I, I think we might want to get into a little bit more uh, conversation about that. Um, capital. I said and and just one remark on. Uh, on, on Bitcoin and blockchain. To me, and I do not say this lightly because I wrote my thesis on uh, on Bitcoin uh, or on cryptocurrencies. So I'm a business information systems engineer, which means I really delved deep into the technical issue because I didn't want to be kind of... I may have asked you the questions about how <laughs> <laughs> You know way more than me. <laughs> um, so because, you know, I suspected you, maybe they know more than I, so I delved really deep into the technical side. And to me, I fully agree with Gunnar here that Bitcoin is really based as a medium of exchange. The money, the, the cryptocurrency side, is really based on the non-distinction of property and possession, creating kind of the perfect medium of exchange, but the problem is nobody needs it. You know, so uh, because there are no contracts nominated in Bitcoin, there are people voluntarily using it, and they might as well do, you know, why not? But, <laughs> you know, as, as long as it's not established as a, uh, as a money of account, you might as well, you know, uh, just so. So I believe it's the non-distinction of property and possession that leads to the Bitcoin as a cryptocurrency hype, and to the, and the blockchain hype to me is nothing but the non-distinction of private and public law, and the non of the non-observation of the dialectic of those two types of law, because they are inherently, you know, opposing each other and they need each other at the same time, and and if you overlook that and you dream of kind of the executability of law. So we make the contracts just perfect, you know, and then the machine is just, the algorithm is set out, set out perfectly. We don't even need the, the, the legal professionals anymore because the, the, the algorithm has, has it all set, right? So, so I believe that law, uh, and I'm following Katharina Pistor here, is always in between executability and nihilism. So like, okay, you know, the, the big guys up there, they do whatever they want, so law doesn't matter at all. Well, then we don't have an economy. But Trying to make law executable is just uh, re regurgitating, in my view, uh, what is called in German the Begriffsjurisprudenz. So these were people in the 19th century thinking about, can we come up with legal terms that are so precise that we can calculate out law, right? So that we can make it a mathematical process. Oh, yeah. Well, yeah, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, exactly the same thing uh, uh, just happens in, in sort of in many ways in everyday legal processes, in, 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 not in dissimilar ways at all. Uh, I mean, this is why my, my particular area of law, uh, interesting area of law is equity, for precisely that reason, that it, it, that it reveals the, the possibility uh, of, of law within, that exists within that type of law that it is always striven for, um, actually. Um, so, yeah, sorry. To that no, no, yeah, it's all, sorry. It's your, it's your, your research. Okay, right on time. We're just about done. Thank you very much indeed for all the contributors and speakers.